Greetings 105 students! My name's Ryan, and in this video I'm going to take you through the Fundamental Lab Science Skills Experiment. Let's start by talking about the point of this experiment. This experiment has a few objectives, one of these being to help you learn the scientific method of investigation, which is the standard method scientists use to study things. This method usually involves four steps. Step one is to make an observation about a phenomenon, or whatever it is you're interested in, and ask a question about its nature. For example, let's say you're making pancakes and you notice bubbles form on them after they've been cooking a while. So you might wonder what's causing the bubbles to form. Step two is to make a hypothesis, or a postulate if you will, that explains how your phenomenon works. A real hypothesis is not simply a guess. It's a prediction based on what's already known about your phenomenon. So, in order to make one, you have to learn as much as you can about whatever it is you're studying. In our example, if you did some research on the pancake's ingredients, you might find that one of them, baking powder, gives off carbon dioxide when it's heated. Therefore, we could hypothesize that pancakes made without baking powder will not form bubbles. The next step is to perform an experiment to test your hypothesis. For our experiment, we would make a batch of pancakes without baking powder and compare the results to a batch made with it. If you're curious what that looks like, just see for yourself. And finally, depending on what your experimental results tell you, you may have to revise your hypothesis and or perform follow-up experiments. In our example, if we had still got bubbles in our pancakes, we could take another look at the ingredients and see if there was something else in there we could omit. In this experiment, you are going to use the scientific method to study five different reactions and solutions. For four of these, you will have to hypothesize what the outcome of the various tests you will perform will be. Naturally, before you can do this, you will have to learn as much as you can about the reactions and solutions. Some of the info you'll need to do this is in the experiment background, and some is in your textbook and lecture notes. After you've learned what you can about the things you'll study in this experiment, you will make your hypotheses, note the plural, there'll be a few of them, in your lab notebook. And you'll need to do it before you come to lab. A complete hypothesis includes the rationale behind it, so when you write yours, make sure you include the reason why you think the way you do. When you get to lab, your TA will check them and offer feedback as needed. Once your coat and goggles are on, it will be time to start your experiments. As you perform them, you will need to record your observations in your lab notebook. And this brings us to another of the learning objectives of this experiment, making thorough observations and taking complete notes. To make sure your notes and observations are complete, you will need to record the appearance of your reagents before you use them, during any reaction you perform with them, as well as their appearance after the reaction is complete. In this example, you can see the solution here is initially colorless, but if we add another solution that is also colorless to it, we get a reddish color. However, we can do better than simply saying the solution was colorless and then became red. Even though it changed color, it's still clear and not cloudy like the contents of this flask, so you could note that as well. You could also feel the flask and see if it changed temperature, or smell the contents and see if their odor changed. The point is, when making observations, you want to keep your senses open and note as much as you can. Alrighty, now let's talk about the experiments you'll be doing and how you'll be performing them. There are five of these, and most of them will require you to form one or more hypotheses about them. The first experiment in your procedure involves the precipitation of insoluble salts. In this one, you will take several different salt solutions, mix them together two at a time in every possible combination they can be mixed, and see whether or not you get a precipitate. Before you come to lab, you will need to hypothesize which combinations will form a precipitate and which won't. To make this easier, for both your hypotheses as well as your data collection, try arranging the salts into tables in your notebook. Of all the various solutions you will be given, most will be soluble, but one or two of them might not. Your first task in this experiment will be to use your powers of observation to tell the soluble ones from the not soluble ones. For the precipitation experiment itself, you'll mix the soluble solutions together in a plastic plate. This plate has small wells, so you'll only need to use two or three drops of each solution. When you're done, dispose of the solutions you added to the plate in the lab room's waste container. 
then add some glass cleaner to the wells, scrub them out, and rinse it thoroughly. In the illumination experiment, you will use an LED lamp to test a few different solutions for their ionic strength. If the solution you're testing has no ions dissolved in it, it won't be able to conduct electricity and the LEDs won't light. If the solution has a lot of ions, it will conduct electricity and the lamp will light up brightly. And if it has a few ions, the LEDs will light, but they'll be dim. Before you come to lab, you will need to hypothesize which of the solutions you'll be given should conduct electricity and which should not. As you're performing your tests, make sure to rinse the lamp's probe in DI water between solutions. If you don't, you'll contaminate them. The heat transfer experiment will involve not one, not two, but three different reactions. These will either be endothermic reactions that absorb heat from their surroundings, or exothermic reactions that evolve heat to their surroundings. Your procedure document will tell you which is which. You will need to hypothesize, in your notebook, whether the flasks these take place in will feel warm or cold to the touch after the reaction is complete. For your first reaction, you'll add some barium hydroxide to a flask, then add some ammonium thiocyanate to that same flask, mix it up real good, and put it on a puddle of water on a wooden block. After a couple of minutes, you'll try to pick the flask up and watch what happens. For your second reaction, you'll add some DI water to a flask, then add a few grams of ammonium chloride to that same flask, mix, and monitor the reaction's temperature over the following few minutes. And finally, you will add a few grams of sodium hydroxide to a flask of DI water. As for the previous flask, you'll monitor this one's temperature over the following several minutes. Moving on to the magic color station. This one is somewhat unique in that there are no hypotheses to test here. It's mostly about honing your observational skills. This experiment will take place in two parts. In part one, you will first add a couple drops of universal indicator to a solution of acid. You'll then bring the solution's pH up to nine by slowly adding sodium hydroxide solution to it. The indicator will tell you when you've reached the right pH by causing the solution to change to a certain color when it's at that pH. If you overshoot, don't panic, just add a few drops of acid to bring the pH down again. In Magic Color Station Part 2, you will take the solution you made in the first part and use a special reaction involving 2-chloro-2-methylpropane to reacidify it. All you have to do to start this reaction is add some prepared 2-chloro-2-methylpropane. You can track this reaction the same way you brought the acid solution to pH 9, that is, by monitoring the solution's color. And at last, we come to the fifth part of your experiment, which involves two gas-forming reactions. For the first reaction, you will react magnesium metal with hydrochloric acid. You'll do this on a balance so you can monitor the reactant's masses as it proceeds. Of course, for this to work, you are going to need your reagent's masses before you initiate the reaction. Keep that in mind when you go to collect your data. Before you come to lab, you must hypothesize whether or not you will observe a change in mass as the reaction takes place. For your second gas-forming reaction, you will make elephant toothpaste. There's no hypothesis to form for this one, it's mostly an observational exercise. It will give you a chance to be a little creative with the toothpaste's color, so that's neat. To make the toothpaste, you'll mix some detergent into a solution of hydrogen peroxide. Add a little food coloring if you want. Then add a small scoop of sodium or potassium iodide, and stand back and observe. And that's the long and the short of the Fundamental Lab Science Skills Experiment. For more information, read this experiment's background and procedure document, and or talk to your TA.